Thank you. Well, um, interestingly, we um, bumped into each other with, with not saying anything where we were going to meet, looking at work by George Shaw, mm. as we would. We're both doing our homework. And uh, what was sort of intriguing that we were saying to each other, e even though clearly he had a fascination for the things you've just described in those liminal edge lands, um, his basic attitude felt quite different to the thing that we're, we're doing both of us in different ways, the idea of exploring the um, memory spaces and, and edges of the city where they're not n n over narrated, where somebody hasn't put too much in. And we're sort of uh, looking to tease out both histories and glimpses of what's coming in the future. And with George Shaw, you felt that, that um, he was, uh, had an intimacy with, with this patch of scrub wood or whatever or his own memories of this council estate that he was looking at and painting very harshly with this uh, enamel paint that gave it a real edge of its own and yet um, in this project his, his back was turned he wasn't, he wasn't someone who's going to wander he's not, he's not looking, he's not prospecting he's, he's found what he needs quite close at hand and in this case, it's this very interesting engagement with what's in this building, which could be completely intimidating, but he's made it over into his own terms. And he's caught these, these moments. He says that there are no people in, in any of the images apart from one, one of himself peeing against a tree. Otherwise, the people are not there. But he says, it's not that they're not there, but I'm painting the absence. I'm painting the kind of ghost presences. And I guess that's part of what you know you you look for and I look for. I mean, you 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 go out on on these kind of expeditions, prospecting with a camera on mm. a on a regular basis. I mean, do you, do you have a sense of what what you're looking for? Is it or is it kind of trying to get lost and a little bit out of your knowledge in that John Clare sense? I think so. I think it's that idea of of breaking out of the quotidian as well you don't have to walk very far and it doesn't really matter where you walk where you live actually, I mean I live in Leytonstone so I, I directly go into a very George Shaw like landscape when I walked into the gallery and one of the first paintings I saw was of these trees and it really did look like a, a, a part of Epping Forest and the, the part of Epping Forest that goes from Leytonstone out to Woodford is very narrow and you can't really completely lose yourself in the sylvan beauty of the forest because you very soon hit a road. But also, there's so many layers of things that, that, that I like the way he's drawn out that idea of the illicit activity and the, the idea there's things happening, there's traces of human activity. There was one painting there that reminded me of a photograph I took on Wanstead Flats, which is which is a waste at the edge of the city, a very edgeland environment, multiple uses over the years. And there was one patch where I was walking with my kids as well, and it was, um, there was some cans of Stella Artois emptied, scrunched up, um, some condom wrappers and a discarded pair of shorts <laughs> all together. And uh, right next to each other, well, that, just, that tells a story of its own, doesn't it? But then the other story being that the location where this was in this a stand of trees was uh, an Italian POW camp during the Second World War and until quite recently, until about 10 years ago there were two, what looked like two tree stumps were actually goal posts that had been erected by the Italian POWs to play football there during the war so you, there's the things you discover very literally i.e. these artefacts of nocturnal activity on them but then also there's that other layer of um, you know, my, my wife's grandfather was an Italian POW, so then we speculate, and he had this kind of mysterious era, this unaccounted form. We thought, God, did he end up on Wanstead Flats near where we now live? Mm. I mean, that's really um, so provocative what you just said, because it, the thing of Epping Forest, which, which is, um, it's massive. It's not, it's not mm. like the, the, the point that George Shaw makes is this. This little scrub wood is is a hundred yards from a housing estate. It's it's nowhere. It's just there, and yet he can he can uh, derive this sort of quotidian, as you say, mystery out of that. He can already reach back into a tunnel that's taking him into some kind of otherness. And I thought um, the the project I did when I I walked around the whole of the M25 motorway as a project, and the last leg 
did come into Epping Forest at night. And, and what was amazing about this was the sudden realisation that this forest was where the poet John Clare had been kept in High Beach in the Silent, and from where he had broken out on his walk back to his home in a village in North Northampton. But but how I measured it, I can remember this vividly, and this is why I was looking at the book, is that when you started to describe the stellar and everything, I realised the only way to calibrate this particular section of road that we were walking through in Epping Forest was making a list of the the cans and the bottles and the Red Bull alongside because you could just actually they weren't from people walking they were just measured where people chucked stuff out of the car <laughs> and I, I looked for that bit and I, it came right back to me it was exactly what you were saying and it's exactly like George Shaw's paintings in the sense that you can create um, a sense of a tribal identity by these objects just scattered in the landscape the, uh, this is a saying we didn't speak, uh, we, we were walking through the woods at night, we were silent by this time. The distance to the roundabout was calculable by reading debris left at the side of the road. There were single cans of Foster's, official beer of the Sydney Olympics, Stella Artois, Carlsberg Special Brew and Tango. There were two packets of Walker's Crisps, cheese and onion, one of salt and vinegar, five McDonald's Coca-Cola cans, one Lambert and Butler king-size cigarette packet, two Marlboro, one silk cut, a coconut bar, Smilers, topical pastilles, four cans of Red Bull, a carbonated taurine drink with caffeine, three burger cartons, one milk carton, Diet Cola, Dr Pepper, orange peel, knotted condoms, one stainless steel watch, LB417, Japan. One burnt out car, police aware. One motorcycle engine. And these are the contour rings of civilization as they spread out from Old Orleans, a taste of the Deep South roundhouse. This is a midden for future archaeologists, present forest creatures. There's one fox and there are three grey squirrels. And we've had enough of the road because we plunge into the deep woods and we navigate by sound. And it's my intention to hit the earthworks of Amesbury Banks, the ancient camp excavated by the Essex Field Club in 1881 and 1882 under the direction of the redoubtable General Pitt Rivers. And it's now being promoted as an alternative off-highway attraction, a rival to the Old Orleans Roadhouse with its Georgian carriage lamps. The Amesbury Banks is an ancient earthwork and can be seriously damaged by cycling. Please do not ride your mountain bike here. The attention of visitors also drawn to the fact that many of the beech trees in the forest are dead and dying. I thought that is exactly, you know, in a sense what he's painting and, and what you describe. And, uh, and finding those things is almost like a form of archaeology that, yeah. that you... You, you tease these everyday items and something, a, a system emerges from that. And I went up in America, as doing another book called American Smoke, I went up into the Sierra Nevada mountains where the poet and ecologist Gary Snyder uh, was living all on his own in this kind of um, Zen practice and his, his uh, very, very disciplined lifestyle. And we, we talked for some time up there. And then after we'd been doing that for a while, he said to me, is Epping Forest all right? <laughs> this was like <laughs> one of the most amazing <laughs> moments of my life that he should actually be considering. He knew the developments that were going on in the Lee Valley that, that he, said, you know, he thought that was the most sort of important and significant part of London, that this forest should survive with those traces and a place where you can get lost. Yeah, I mean, it still very much is. And I was doing a walk, uh, re uh, actually it was last September was the first stage of it, and it was um, for the next book I'm working on, it was following the traces of the uh, Buxton family, who are partly responsible. The Buxton family helped found the London Hospital, the, obviously the Truman's Truman Brewery, Brewery, Truman's yeah. Brewery, yeah, but they did, and they did lots of kind of charitable works in the East End, that, uh, related to Elizabeth Fry somehow as well. And they lived in Leightonstone, Leightonstone House, right on the edge of the forest, and then they um, moved from there to up the Lee Valley to East Nye, to East Nye House, which they built, which is now in a sort of missionary college uh, near uh, Stances Margaret's, near Ware, Hartford area. So I was doing that, that walk along there. And Edward North Buxton 
was the first veeder of Epping Forest and was responsible, partly responsible for maintaining the forest that we enjoy today. But just along from the house, that su- uh, Sunday last September, um, I w- you, c- you could only go so far to the hollow ponds because it was completely sealed off by police because the, you know, the body of a Turkish gangster had been chopped up, placed in Ikea bags and dumped at the hollow ponds. And uh, that's something that somebody found on their morning walk with their dog. It had been there for three weeks. And uh, so that still mm-hmm. exists. And as I, was, as I was taking some photographs and videoing this macabre scene of the police who uh, had sealed off the area, it was, it was this horrible crime had taken place. And right next to the police lines was the boating lake where there was the ice cream van. There were families sat almost against the police tape licking ice creams where this thing had happened yards away. And so I was videoing this scene. I thought, this is fascinating. And then I did a George Shaw and thought, I'll go for a, you know, go for and urinate in the trees, as, as he does. And uh, didn't hear the sound of, of, of liquid on, on, on trees. It was on tarpauling. And there was somebody who was living in the trees opposite where this crime had taken place. Again, the image in the George Shaw painting of this mm-hmm. piece of uh, polythene hanging over a tree. And it, it, all these things colliding in that one little yeah. patch of edgeland. Well, I think that, it, that is really one of the aspects of, of the edgeland is that it is the territory in which the invisibles choose to live. I mean, going up and down the Lee Valley in that area for, for many years, you, you, you became aware of communities of travellers, obviously, who, who passed through. They were, they were not invisible, but they kind of passed through in the way that the, the gypsies were passing through Epping Forest in the period of John Clare, mm-hmm. that, that he sees people he knows from around Peterborough and they're still they're moving south they're moving through and they're in the forest for a time but by the time they're noticed they're gone he comes back there's, no, there's nothing there they're gone there, there's a hut the ones who used to used to be around the, the sections of the Lee um, tended to live under and around a lot of the motorway bridges and places like that because they, they got a living from fishing um, metal out of, out of the River Lee. And I used to see these guys um, you know, sort of st- stripped off to the waist. They're diving into the, into the River Lee with hooks and pulling up bikes and motorbikes. And you know, kind of this pirated ecology of these, these vanished peoples. And then there were, you know, obviously more recently, there have been kind of migrants of various sorts. Um, because the city is too expensive to live in, camped out in all of these hollows and wildernesses who are under threat and being worn away. I mean, there's something like um, 40 people were living down the bottom of the M11 under a motorway there, and you can actually get in under the motorway and in the bridges around. And that kind of struck me at chord with, with to, to the, bring it to the project that we've mm. just been involved with, um, London Overground, following the traces of the overground railway in a single day around London. Um, you'll, see, you'll see in the film that extract that John shows later, the, the person with me is a filmmaker and kind of performance artist, Andrew Cotting, who's an amazingly energetic presence. And, and he, he agreed to walk right around this railway about 35 or so miles in a single day with me. And... Um, at the end of it, when this is finished and he's, he's going back to the south coast, to Hastings, where he lived, he was in a terrible motorbike accident on the Old Kent Road, which is um, where we passed earlier in the day on the walk. We stopped at a particular spot and he, he uh, showed me where he'd always turn to go on his motorbike when he's going back home. And he's hit by a car and he, he lost a lot of blood, he nearly died and he went to the hospital and so on and so on. So when he'd recovered from this, he wanted to exorcise the, the experience, and we decided that we would do it by night. This is where the night walk comes in, and we went back around the whole thing that we'd done for a book in the day, um, having to register all the particulars of London, and at night it was a kind of erasure. It was the opposite. It was going around in the opposite direction through the night, non-stop, and John, John came along for the first section as far as Hampstead and filmed it. And the experience of London by night was so totally different. And the, the very first thing we passed in Hackney, where we set off, um, was this figure of a, of a man sitting on a bench on Kingsland Road, which is a very busy road in the evenings, and it's kind of hipster bars, and there's lots going on, uh, Turkish... Uh, grocers and 
you know, everything, all, all human life. And this guy is immobile on a, on a bench. And I recognize him because he's somebody who previously I'd only ever seen in Haggerston Park, one of these little London parks that used to be a gasworks and was made into a park after bomb damage in the early 1950s. And he sat on a bench all day, not moving, one spot, one of those kind of invisibles of the city, as if almost he could read the city just by being in one place, while John and I and, and uh, Andrew Cotting and all these others were running about in mad directions. Someone was doing the same thing and letting it all come to him. So it was a great thing to see this guy sitting there. Obviously, when the park shut, he moved a short distance onto this bench. Um, and then the next morning, when Andrew and I had walked right through the night, and it was 10 o'clock the next morning, we're coming back, I got him to detour to Haggerston Park, and this man was now sitting there. And I felt the madness of what this journey that we had undertaken was all completely absorbed in this man had gone a hundred yards and knew just as much about London. Everything had come to him but without moving, whereas our neurosis was to, to move. And in a sense, you know, there's something of George Shaw in that, that he, he is able to kind of use the studio to, to bring in that, that uh, vision of, the, of a, a privileged edge, that the point when nature creeps just beyond the houses, but is somewhat perverted by the presence of the people who are going there, almost illegitimately, but, but even at the same time have a relation, a kind of rather beautiful relation with some of the grand images of art, the images of Poussin or Titian or Constable, who've been drawn to, to these um, sylvan scenes for their, for their kind of poetry and their melancholy, and um, normally felt obliged to have human figures in some kind of drama representing mythological scenes. We've come to the stage where that's gone. That carnival has moved on and all you've got is the, the traces and the, the slightly damaged trees. And George says that he actually looks, he wants to see graffiti on trees. It's a, it's a sort of a, a sign of, of some kind of coding that he's after. Um, and here it is, and, and uh, we have to invent pilgrimages or ways of walking to reach that same state, which then comes back, and in John's case it was edited and worked over and made in, into a film, interrogation, and in my case um, assembled into books, I mean John's doing books as well, obviously, and there's a kind of neurotic impulse to be constantly out there, but constantly exploring those sort of spaces, as if they they have some signs and signifiers that we can't get from the, the normal and accepted parts of the city. And I think that's because the city, we were talking about this before, uh, is turning inside out. You know, the, the, the idea when the, when the city evolved into the great first railway age, um, you had the notion that uh, the, the river in London has built up a a working port has built up warehouses and uh, factories, ink factories, like where Dickens has to work as a child. All of these things are around the river at the centre. And the factories of money, the city, it's all loaded there. And the escape is the railways will take you out into, into a, a controlled version of the pastoral, the suburb. It's out there. It's a kind of idyllic semi-village and it carries you in. Gradually that turned round inside out and the estates that were growing up in the centre, what had been the inner city, the places like where I live in Hackney, are now I mean, designed almost like suburban estates with, with small gardens and a, and a uniform pattern. And beyond that, the overground system, the, the ring of this railway, is itself a suburb. It doesn't matter where you are on it, you are all part of this same suburb. It's not an inside-outside thing. It's you, could, you could be in um, Denmark Hill, or you could be in Wilston, or you could be in, in Dalston Junction. It's all part of this system, which has got uh, new build sets of flats going up all round it because the railway allows you to get somewhere else. It's got um, artisan bread and coffee and gyms, all those things grow up in the railway arches underneath. And you've created a donor to kind of microclimate of a suburban state within the city. And the suburbs themselves then became more places of expulsion. Some of the, some of the elements of the old inner city that the, 
the developers and boosters find inconvenient are kind of gradually nudged outwards and the, the edges get rougher again. And, and talking to uh, state agents who reclaimed the industrial properties, built up everything they can get their hands on in the middle, they're now, they're now looking to, to try to persuade people out to Barking and Dagenham and along the Thames. And all of those great spaces, the marshlands around the, the Thames estuary, are, are seriously threatened because the political will is to not be able to bear a, a non-narrated space. You have to have an Erith marshes that are threatened by an enormous Disneyland combined with the BBC, they're going to create a kind of Doctor Who theme park because you have to have some visible kind of attractor to work with a railway hub and that makes the whole nature of how the city was configured different. I don't know if you noticed that in your... In your yeah, well... you've I mean, also been involved a lot with a lot, a lot of community activity. I have done, yeah. I mean, uh, just through... The party came out of the... The book, I tried to sign out and pick how it happened in a way, but because I'd written this book that dealt with, it's not a political book at all, it's, you know, it's a book of, I, I saw it in a way as a travel book, but one of the things that emerged when you go into what I described as overground, you know, overlooked London being, uh, you know, if you look on the BBC, if you just put in London, the only times, there's certain parts of London, that the only times you ever hear about them is if there's been a crime, you know. <laughs> And, and you, you know, put, 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 search for Perivale, search for uh, Belvedere, search for Erith, search for Leytonstone, all you get is crimes. You get nothing positive. Um, and when you go into those spaces to, to, to explore them, to look at them, to try and, and to consider them, um, one of the themes that emerges is a strong sense of civic pride when these places, they came into a lot of the railway suburbs, they were built up in, between the 1860s and the 1920s, and a lot of the kind of the large buildings that still exist were built in that period of a great outburst of civic pride. They produced these wonderful publications in the 20s when they were celebrating their 50th anniversaries. And you know, they, they were linking places like Stratford, you know, the borough of West Town was kind of claiming lineage from Druidic ceremonies that took place in Stratford Green. You know, when you read about uh, Brentford and... Um, Hanwell, they claim, well, they don't, it's, it's a solid claim, you know, that it, it, the first people that came there came along Neolithic trackways, which went north. So uh, you see the absence of that as well in the current time. So these two things go side by side, and from that, somehow got involved in campaigns to save things. But actually, things were being saved weren't out on the fringes. They were very, it was around the overground circuit. So you have the New Era estate in Hoxton, for example which is a very unusual type of social housing development, and it's a charitable trust, but it's almost self-managed. So you have sometimes three, four generations of the same families living on this kind of red brick LCC estate, a very unique environment. Um, and that was all just sold off to uh, Britain's richest MP and a massive American corporation. And they would just said, well, after two years, you'll have to pay commercial rent, which commercial rent for that part of London is about 3000 no, it was £2,000 a week, I think. Oh, some, some, some crazy amount of money, £3,000 a month from £500 a month. Um, and there were many, many more. You see them around uh, Barnet, around um, the edge of the Welsh Harp. I'd written about the Welsh Harp Reservoir as this kind of reserve, this area of uh, specific scientific interest, SSI. Um, and that's now going to be completely built over by the London Borough of Barnet with private housing. Barrett homes were given the land by the London Borough of Barnet, not sold it, they were given the land where this housing is, council estate is, all the people will be dispersed, the ones that have to be kept will be put on a tower block built away from the river, the lake, sorry, by the North Circular Road, and then the private estate by Barrett Homes, which has all been sold off plan overseas, will be built around the lake and into the lake, the whole heritage element of that and the ecological aspects of it will be completely... Yeah, there seems like again back to the paintings there seems like a strong strong sense that um, urban lived dwellers really have to find spaces in which they can kind of enact their visions and um, mm -hmm. and to find those spaces comes in different ways and, and obviously people are always sort of trying to crawl around that corner to find something that's unoccupied that has has the traces 
um, really, really like explorers in, in looking for looking for a frontier, mm-hmm. and, and you can you can find it as he did, a hundred yards from from housing. You can find it as uh, when when we're again with Andrew Cotting, we took this Swan pedalo from Hastings to Hackney by the back river. Suddenly, coming out of Maidstone, you there's a stretch of river that's only approachable. Um, you you can only get into this landscape of woodland either off a, a busy kind of dual carriage road or, or from the river. So nobody goes there. So quite by accident, it becomes somewhere where hermits or people who've dropped out in various ways live. And there's a guy living there entirely with rabbits that he kept and, and ate and fishing. And, and um, using the other side of it, the urban side of it, to go to the big supermarket out on the dual carriageway and knock off the electricity on purpose and um, get the, what was thrown out of the deep freeze cabinet at night, which was always ice cream. So he's living on ice cream and rabbits and fish and was hidden away in these woodlands. These are the kind of invisibles of this landscape. And um, Nick Papadimitri, who, who mm-hmm. John made an earlier film with a very uh, excellent film, is, is, a, is a kind of urban visionary who, who has explored his territory on the western side to the point where I was doing an event with him and he, he was talking about this and I'm sure he's told you often that he identifies so closely with that landscape that he feels like an exchange of his DNA that mm-hmm. he actually became the place he was describing and that's a kind of very painterly experience this idea that you you go out and you stare at this tree long enough you, you become it and, and there are the people at the ed- look at, look to the edge in that way to find the kind of broken poetry of the city, it's out there. In the same way that the edge of the city used to be defined by the place where the huge hospitals and lunatic asylums were. I mean, there once were contagious diseases further down the Thames, and the ones at the north around Shenley or, or Epsom, which is far enough out from the centre where you could put people who were visionaries or, or mad or damaged or needed to be removed. And then all of those spaces become converted into private estates so we're, we're in that we're in that strange inside out thing again or the the places that would have been a relief both for the city to, to rid itself of, of the most disturbing elements but also a place where those elements could heal that's gone and instead of that it's a kind of this hunger for a kind of a private space and property has taken over those spaces and and pushed the vibe back into the city so there's a constant process of inside-outside going on. Well, it's funny because when I interviewed Ian for that, it's a film called The London Perambulator, and when I interviewed Ian for that 2008, uh, I think I made a comment, and, and Nick's territory is sort of northwest London, he's sort of heading sort of around uh, towards, Worm, out from Wormwood Scrubs as far as uh, Mogden Purification Works, so they're going out sort of Hillingdon area out west there, and I said to Ian about the appeal of Edgelands, why would someone like Nick go to these spaces? And, and you said, in the future you'll have to come into the city to find Edgelands. Uh, and that's where it will be, that it's the city's imploding. And it was funny, actually, when we did an interview for, for this, for London Overground, uh, you, you made the observation, the very astute observation, that the, the aspect of the overground development, he says it's a self-contained ring, it has no hinterland. Yeah. There is no connection with the territory around it. And you and you really see that in a you know I, li- I live on the outer side of it you live sort of right next to it and it doesn't connect with any of the territory I mean it, it doesn't have an edge land no, does it no, no everything everything like all the property development around it all it says is you are seven minutes from the um, Liverpool Street you're twelve minutes from you know wherever so essentially you it's describing a state of perpetual motion you're somewhere only to be close to somewhere else. So there is, there is this, in the end, there is no locality. The whole push is to dissolve the particulars of the local and to create a kind of generic force field where everything is much the same. There's a unified state. You could be anywhere in this ring and gradually it becomes the same. Because what we were seeing in, in the part that was not familiar to me, Old Oak Common out mm-hmm. near Wilsdon on yeah. the western side, I recognised instantly as being exactly the same as had happened on the eastern side in the Lee Valley. Exactly the same tropes, exactly the same state of development, exactly the same way that an old car showroom is given over to the Science Museum. So you, you put in a museum, 
you know, like the Smithsonian comes into you know into the Olympic Park or whatever. Yeah. You create that as part of a self-fulfilling prophecy to get footfall into these areas, yeah. but those areas are not any longer part of Stratford. This is the, the the whole weirdness of what was going on in Wilsdon, the whole magic that attracted someone like Leon Kossoff, the painter, to this. Yeah. wonderful sort of series of skies and old industries that history is eradicated into something that looks exactly like the mirror image on the other side I mean, you, I mean, you talked about that didn't you the book being um, about walking away from the Stratford hub but also that it's the overground spills out of the Stratford hub yeah. is a product of it and the develop this new London that you see emerging around the overground is a product of what happened at Stratford and of course it it, the overground links the two Westfields yes. as well. It's almost like a Westfield shuttle, isn't it? Yeah. You finish in well, one. It is, literally, that's yeah. what it becomes. You can go to the other. That, that, I mean, this is why all this sort of activity is significant, I think, because it's a kind of antidote to, to the idea that eventually you create these pedestrian permeabilities and hubs between um, developed supermarkets, mall type zones. That, that are the only convenient place to get to by the, f the forms of transport and the rest of the forms of transport decay and uh, you know, essentially pelotons of cyclists take over the, the canal banks and all these bits in between, these sort of liminal passageways of the city are, are destroyed it's, I, don't I almost don't want to raise this because it's too ominous in a way because you, you talked about the walk, you, uh, the walk anticipates the future Yeah, and you've had an uncanny knack of doing that in the past you know if you go back to Down River you know it's about the whole horrors of the Thatcher era lights out for the territory is a kind of corrupt end of that period leading giving away to Tony Blair and London Orbital is like kind of peak Blair millennial London the grand project we, Ghost Milk is the horror of the Olympics uh, Edge of the Orison is that idea of you know Prescott wanting to develop Middle England and yeah. there being no people there, and if the war, if the overground walk anticipates the future, it's interesting because the Stratford hub, the that Lower Lee Valley area, was once that kind of dangerous, kind of edge land area, wasn't it? That's kind of well, it was, it was, it was interesting it was, territory it, to I mean, explore. It was, wasn't uh, it? it was open territory. This mm. is the thing. It, it it had a history that was dirty and difficult in in the. Kind of second industrial revolution, the plastics, all of the kind of smelly old factories that were there because of this river that happened to be there. But on the other hand, it had lots of lost orchards, it had lots of reclaimed wilderness. It, it, it was gradually ameliorating all of the damage that had been done to it and all the bomb damage in the way that the, the football pitches were all built on top of the rubble of damaged terraces of the East End, yeah. uh, some of which were taken away to make parking space and, and never given back. So, so you kind of saw a, a landscape that, that allowed you to, to meet and interact with incredibly interesting people. I was always meeting. And, and then gradually there they are culled because some other, other description is made to it. Uh, and so the edge, the, finding the edge is, has become kind of an impossible task anymore.